So what types of infections do we tend to see with methicillin-resistant staph in our companion animals? Um, well, pyoderma and otitis are going to be really number one and two. These are very, very common. Uh, urinary tract infections, also frequently caused by staph pseudintermedius, wound infections, surgical site, nosocomial infections. Um, remember, this is an opportunist. So whenever it gains entry to a normally sterile site, or whenever host defenses are compromised, we can see uh, infection. Really important to know that while oftentimes I think we like to focus on hospitals and, and healthcare associations for antimicrobial resistance, you need to know that MRSP is frequently community acquired. So contact with a hospital is not required in order to have an infection with this resistant organism. Because these organisms are antimicrobial resistant and potentially have a broad host range, there's always a concern about zoonotic transmission. And I think there's a few things that we should uh, recognize. One is that we share a lot of organisms with our pets, including our coagulase positive staph, staph pseuds and staph aureus, whether or not they're methicillin resistant. And so there's likely a lot of transmission going on that is under recognized. Um, in the case of dog to human transmission, this is probably staph pseudintermedius. And then in the case of human to dog transmission, which also absolutely occurs, it's staph aureus. So what do we do if a patient is positive? Number one, don't panic. Um, if a dog or a cat is uh, positive for MRSA, if they either have an infection with it or colonization, if that for some reason is identified, likely it came from a person that the animal is already in close contact with. So what you're likely seeing is uh, reverse zoonotic transmission, for lack of a better word, from the owner or someone else in the household into the pet. If they have MRSP, um, this is an organism that we do not typically consider to be a major zoonosis. Cases absolutely can occur. They are reported, um, but it's not something that's frequent. And I'll, I'll show you in a couple of slides um, some data that I hope will convince you that this is an infrequent occurrence. In the case of canine MRSA or MRSP, um, do not attempt decolonization. So we don't have evidence to suggest that we can effectively eliminate this organism from the animal. Um, trying to stick antibiotics up a dog's nose or treat them systemically is unlikely to be successful and will likely just select for more antimicrobial resistance. Probably the most important thing to do, um, either for yourself or to advise your clients, is good hygiene. So hand hygiene, critically important, especially after picking up feces. We know that the intestines are an important site of colonization. Avoiding contact with saliva and nasal secretions, so not letting the dog lick your face, and then keeping the animal away from any particularly sensitive area of the body, so wounds or ports or indwelling devices. There's an excellent resource at the Worms and Germs blog, which is run out of the University of Guelph uh, School of Veterinary Medicine, and they have some really useful sort of lay language summaries of the risks of both methicillin-resistant staph and a wide variety of other topics in infectious disease. This is a resource that I think is helpful for both future veterinarians and also vets to share with their clients to help them to take the most appropriate protective measures. So having said all of that, human infections with staph pseudintermedius do occur. And this was a study that I had an opportunity to be involved with, with some infectious disease physicians from Calgary, Alberta. Um, and we were able to report and describe 24 cases of people with staph pseudintermedius infections in that area of Alberta. So of the 24 patients that we identified, 22 of them had canine contact that was temporarily associated with the infection. So there seemed to be good evidence that this likely had been acquired from a dog. Looking at the patient population, there was a median age of 61 and a roughly even gender split. Uh, most of these infections, so about three quarters, were skin and soft tissue infections. They tended to be more superficial. Um, and only three out of 24, so one eighth of these infections, were methicillin resistant. Infections with methicillin susceptible staph pseudintermedius were much more common. The isolates that we identified were genetically heterogeneous, so they were all different from each other, they were unrelated. 
And really what this pointed to was no evidence of a point source. So the patients hadn't uh, sort of come into contact with one dog or one area where they were put at risk. So true community acquisition. And then I think perhaps the most important and, and interesting finding that we had is that the incidence of staph aureus among skin and soft tissue infections was 600 times greater than that of staph pseudintermedius. So while these staph pseudintermedius infections do occur, they are literally hundreds of times less common than are staph aureus infections. More recently, I've had an opportunity to work as part of an interdisciplinary team describing uh, human staph pseudintermedius infections here in Saskatchewan, and we've been able to publish a number of case reports um, looking at oncology patients, we had a pediatric patient, um, and a man who had a urinary tract infection, um, all of which uh, transmission from the dog was demonstrated. So why are we seeing increasing reports of human infections with staph pseudintermedius if I've just sort of said, it's really not very likely, it's not very common, it's not an enormous risk? Well, I think there's a few reasons that we can sort of attribute this change to. One is that we've had taxonomic changes. So staph pseudintermedius was recognized as distinct from staph intermedius in 2007. So it's a kind of new-ish species or newly identified species. The name staph pseudintermedius is new. There's increased awareness of zoonotic transmission among both physicians and veterinarians. The sort of whole One Health movement um, has, I think, really made these types of infections more top of mind. And there's greater contact between uh, people working in different sort of silos of the health sciences. So myself as a veterinarian working with infectious disease physicians, for instance. We have improved diagnostics. So the introduction of MALDI-TOF in human diagnostic labs may have allowed isolates, which may have been misidentified in the past, to be correctly speciated. So staph pseudintermedius has probably been there all along, and we just perhaps didn't have the tools in order to identify it. And then finally, I think we're seeing this as partially an artifact of the impacts of resistance. So resistance among coagulase positives has sort of raised the profile of the genus as a whole. So what we see with MRSA in people has sort of led to concern about other potential uh, reservoirs of methicillin-resistant staph and more research um, going into these potential pathogens. So while we are seeing more reports of human infections with staph pseudintermedius, this doesn't necessarily reflect the emergence of a new pathogen. It may just be that we are now recognizing the presence of something that has been going on for a long time. So what about MRSA, methicillin-resistant staph aureus? Well, this is a, a screenshot from the CARS report, so describing the impact of methicillin-resistant staph aureus in Canada. Um, from 2016 to 2020. And what we can see is that community-associated uh, infections are trending up. They're becoming more common. What do we know about MRSA in animals? Well, in our dogs and cats, um, when we see infections with MRSA, these are frequently human-associated strains, suggesting that the transmission has gone from either the owner or some other household contact into the pet. So it's kind of a reverse zoonotic situation. In horses, we tend to see equine-specific strains of MRSA, um, which don't occur generally in people, except for people who have contact with horses. In wildlife, and I mean many different species, so fish, reptiles, marine mammals, mammals, birds, etc., 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 MRSA has been identified. And then finally, livestock-associated MRSA, particularly the strain sequence type 398, which is sort of notorious for its presence in pigs and cattle. Um, ST398 is a really interesting story. It was first identified in 2005 in the Netherlands and was found to be highly prevalent among pigs. So at that time, approximately 40% of animals um, were shown to be colonized. And where this became really problematic is that in people working with pigs, we were seeing spillover and potentially infections in some of those individuals. Um, in the Dutch population, 
those people working with pigs were found to be 760 times more likely to be colonized than the general population. Fortunately, this is a strain that didn't spread terribly efficiently between people. So a person would acquire this strain from a pig, perhaps develop an infection themselves, but it didn't tend to spread beyond that one individual. MRSA ST398 is highly associated with livestock, and while we particularly identify it in pigs, it's also been found in veal calves, dairy cattle, poultry, horses, dogs, people, really anywhere that it's subsequently been looked for. We know that veterinarians um, working with sick animals, working with animals who have infections, working in uh, highly selective environments where we have antimicrobial use are more likely to be colonized with MRSA than the general population. So some older studies um, found that 4.4% of small animal veterinarians were MRSA positive, so about three times the rate of the general population. Those who worked with MRSA patients were even more likely, so 12.5% of those individuals, approximately 10% of equine vets, 15% of large animal vets generally. And then if we look at swine veterinarians, 45% of those people were colonized with MRSA. So there is an occupational hazard of MRSA colonization um, associated with veterinary work, but the impact of this hazard and sort of the magnitude of the effect on this is not terribly great. We don't see a tremendous burden um, on the health of veterinarians associated with this colonization. What this really means is you need to be aware of your potential status as a carrier of MRSA. And if you go on to develop an infection, it's really important to let your doctor know um, that you are potentially at risk so that they can treat you appropriately from the outset. So just to summarize, uh, methicillin resistance is really not about methicillin. What we're really talking about is resistance to all beta-lactam drugs. Because methicillin resistance is not due to the production of beta-lactamases, drugs like amoxicillin with clavulanic acid will not be helpful. This will not work. The susceptibility profiles of staphylococci are changing, and laboratory guidance is very, very important um, to help you select which drug is most appropriate for your patient. And then finally, methicillin resistance doesn't just affect companion animals. So watch out for methicillin resistant staph in livestock as well, um, whether it's mastitis in cattle, bumblefoot in chickens or other poultry, or staph hyacus um, causing greasy pig disease or MRSA uh, associated skin infections in pigs. I don't have any new terms today, but just a couple of questions for self-assessment. Mm -hmm.